Well, good morning, Northridge. How are we doing today? We are so excited that you are here. And hey, in just a minute, one of my favorite things we get to do as a church together, we're going to celebrate baptism. And I'm here with these guys that are gonna be getting baptized this morning. If you're maybe new to Northridge or you don't know, baptism is this opportunity where we get to celebrate what Jesus has already done for us. These guys have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they are here today to declare that to the world. So we're gonna get going in just a second. But before we get started in worship and celebrating baptism, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for being who, you, who we need you to be. God, you are our savior. You are the one that provides. You are the one that is. So God, for these that are, that are coming forward and saying, this is who I am. I belong to Jesus. I just pray, God, that this morning would be such a special time. Thank you that as a church family, we get to come alongside them and celebrate with them in this time. God, we love you and we thank you so much that you have loved us first. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray, amen. All right, let's celebrate together, guys. Will you please stand and let's praise the Lord together. Let everything that has been praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Put your hands together. Let, Let everything, everything come on, come on. That has been praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'm praising the valley, I praise on the mountain. I'm praise when I'm sure, and I praise when I'm doubting. I praise me no number, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord of oh my soul.
Lord is my shepherd And he is everything I need So I will not worry Oh, I will not fear the enemy He said that he loves me He said that he's with me even though I walk through the valley Of shadow and death And still I know he has good things He has good things for me So I will take heart in deserts and gardens He has good things He has good things for me If I know my Father, I know my Father
Thank you so much for being here. You can take your seat and he... How many of you believe he has good plans, huh? He really does. In spite of what we experience, God is always working for good. We'll actually see that in this weekend's talk. But if you're a guest, welcome to Northridge. Chose a pretty good weekend, right? Isn't it exciting that God is still changing lives at Northridge, seeing all these people baptized? How awesome. Over the course of the weekend, about 31 people have followed the Lord and believers' baptism, which is so exciting. God keeps using this place to bring light into the darkness, and I'm so glad you're a part of it. And I have to tell you, this weekend I get to make a special announcement. Starting at 1 p.m. today, tickets are going on sale for the glory of Christmas, and so it's opening up. The glory of Christmas. And if you're a guest, you don't know what that is. It, each year, we've been doing it for over three decades. This is our 31st year, and over 30,000 people attend this thing. But it's not about the numbers, it's about who those numbers represent. Our entire mission for the glory of Christmas, this special event that we've done for so long, has been to wake the world up to Jesus, to show his love, to tell his truth, to involve them, to share the good news with people who wouldn't normally hear it. And so the reason we open up tickets first to those of you who are a part of Northridge, this is, this is not going public yet, this is to all of you who are part of Northridge starting at one today, is because you know the mission. It's not just about getting people here. This place will be sold out. It will be sold out. That's not the issue. The issue is having the people who most need the message of Jesus hope here. And you're the best to do that. You know the mission. You know the vision. You know what we're doing. And so we invite you to buy tickets so that we don't have to ask people to come and pay here the gospel. We, we buy tickets and then we pray about and then we invite those special people that we believe can be impacted by that message. And you get to start doing that today at one. But know this, a week from tomorrow, it goes open to the public. And so I, here's my prayer, that we will buy all the tickets for the right people and there'll be no tickets left for the public. Wouldn't that be fun? I mean, let's fill this place with the right people. So with that announcement, I do also need to share that this is a very unique and special year for the glory of Christmas because this is the finale season of the glory of Christmas. It is, I heard that, oh, hey. I didn't say God is dead. I didn't say God is not working. I didn't say the mission isn't alive. I didn't say the church isn't thriving. I just said this is the season finale of the glory of Christmas. And it's a positive thing, but it will come with some awe. And you might be going, why, why would this be the final season? Well, first of all, remember, God called us to be the church, not a concert. That's the first thing. Every weekend, we can invite people to the church of Jesus Christ to hear the good news, and that's what we're about. But God has used the glory of Christmas in amazing ways. Remember, I was the leader when we started this off. Yes, I was 12 years old and the pastor of this church 31 years ago. But you know, with Paul Black and with my wife Roxanne and with so many other leaders involved in this thing for those years, do you know what the most important thing about the glory of Christmas was? Did God want us to keep doing it? That was the thing. It's not about what we want. We love the glory of Christmas. We love it. But it's what, what is God saying? And when we started it, it was unique. We had to cancel something else way back there 30 years, and people were all upset. I had a neighbor, didn't even come to our church, and she was totally angry with me for canceling what we did before to start the glory of Christmas. And now, three decades later, you know, it's going to happen again. But I just need to communicate to you why. Every single year of the glory of Christmas, we have been asking God, is this what you want for us? Because it's not about what we want. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, I see that as an outline for prayer. And so every day as I get to the part of hallowed be your name, I go through characteristics of God so I can remember who he is. And one of those characteristics is that God's timing is perfect. Now, that doesn't mean I like his timing because quite often I don't like his timing. I want what I want when I want it and all that different stuff. But I know this, my timing's not perfect, but God's timing is perfect. 
And so every year we've been praying, God, what's your timing? What's your timing? What's your timing? And each year God says, I want you to do it. Last year, for the first time in three decades, every single one of us, those who were part of the founding and leading it into existence and now a part of leading not only the event but this church, we've all, we really believe he's saying, here's my timing. I've got something new in this new generation for this world we're now living in that I want to unleash in this place. And you have to be willing to let go of the old and hold on to me. And as a pastor for so long, and yeah, you can applaud that for sure. I've been the pastor here 33 years. I'm going to tell you what I've seen. Too many churches and leaders just keep holding on to what they've always done until it dies. And the glory of Christ, and it usually kills the church. I've seen it happen all over the world. And that's not what God wants for this place, for an event to hurt the church. Now, the glory of Christmas is successful now. It's great. But there's something about going out at the right time. I'm a big sports fan. I, I'm sorry. I love Tom Brady. Tom Brady's awesome. And the NFL, it's almost like it doesn't exist because the greatest of all time is not playing this year. But you know what I think about Tom Brady? I think he stayed one year too long. The greatest quarterback ever stayed one year too long. Michael Jordan, one of the, I think, the greatest basketball player of all time. Great. But you know what? He stayed too long. It happens all the time. I think God's timing saying, we're going to take this out as a success so that we can open doors to the new things I'm doing. The second thing I need you to know is that God has taught us to sing new songs. Don't just keep singing the old songs. Isaiah says it. Sing new songs. Sing new songs. Why? Because God's doing new things. It's a new world, new generations. We've got a new generation staff. We have a new generation church, and we're excited about what God wants to do for this new generation. And so we're going to say, God, what new songs do you want us to sing? And here's what I have for you. Please be praying for us. Please be praying hard for us because we're looking for the new adventures, the new ventures God has for us. And I believe 30 years from now, a bunch of people are going to have a visionary leader trying to follow God, and he's going to say, here's where we're going, and they're going to go, oh, because of what new song we're going to be singing. And that's okay. Life's a cycle. Life's a cycle. Life's a cycle. But God is the constant. And we're going to keep waking the world up to Jesus. So look for the new venture. Pray for the new venture. And let's be excited about all God's going to be doing. Are you with me on that, huh? Is that good? All right. But we are having glory of Christmas this year. It's 31st season finale. So does it make buying tickets a little bit more important to you, huh? Getting people who need to see it and hear the gospel buy those tickets up, and let's make this the greatest season of glory of Christmas history as we move into our new season. Okay, with that being announced, I just want you to be aware, if you're a guest here, from the bottom of our heart, we want nothing from you. We want for you to experience the fullness of Jesus. So right now, we're going to move into a time of worship through giving. And you just need to know why we do this. It's not some kind of duty. It's not some kind of need-based thing. Here's what it is. Jesus, through his love and generosity, has totally transformed our lives. He's the giver of all good gifts, and we want to make sure we don't love the gifts he gives more than we love him. And so we generously give, as he's commanded us to do, so that we might be a place that shines the light of Jesus' love around the world together, which is exactly what's happening. And so as we give... We worship. You'll be able to see how to give on the screens, but first let's pray. Father in heaven, thanks for this moment in time. Thank you for the glory of Christmas, for its huge impact. And God, let this year be a wave of impact that we couldn't have imagined. But we thank you that you're not a God that just sings yesterday songs. You're a God that creates brand new songs for the future to tell the same foundational truth. And we ask you to help us to find that new adventure you want us on. And I just pray now as we give that you would take the generosity of your people as they worship you and use it to expand your light and truth here and around the world. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
What's up, Northridge? My name's Dom, and I'm the Young Adults Pastor around here, and I just want to update you with what's going on around Northridge for the next couple of weeks. First up, on Friday, October 6th, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., here at the Plymouth parking lot, we have Faith in Blue Night. Faith in Blue Night is built around law enforcement and the church coming together and seeing what happens in the community when there's a healthy partnership there. So come join us, hang out here in the parking lot, get to know some of the law enforcement in the area, and let's just have a good time furthering the kingdom together. For more information, you can head to www.faithinblue.org. Next up, I wanna tell you about our marriage night that's coming up. On Friday, October 13th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at both of our campuses, we have a marriage night. This night is for investing in your marriage, but it also investing in, in other married couples and having community. This night's gonna be all about the fall, the cider, donuts, hay rides, and just having a good time together. So if you're married, come check out this night. If you want more information or wanna go get registered, go to northridgechurch.com slash marriage. And that's what's happening around Northridge. Upside down. I don't know about you, but boy, is that an apt description of the world I live in. Just upside down. It's in my own personal life, in my own relationships, but certainly as we view the culture and as a pastor, as I even view the reality of the church and churches, upside down is the natural state of people these days. And two weeks ago when we started this series, we looked at how our view is upside down by nature and why. And then last weekend we looked at how God's view is right side up and why. And it showed the contrast between, two, between the two, the antithetical nature of the two, the tension between the two. And if you haven't seen any of those talks or heard them, please engage them on our YouTube channel or on our website. But this weekend we turn to another important conversation in this idea, our choice. Because here we have our natural view, that which comes natural and feels most comfortable and most right from a human standpoint. And then we have God's view, which is so opposite of our normal thinking and seeing and feeling. And then in the middle we have our choice. And it's important to know that we only have a choice because of God's love and grace, because apart from Jesus Christ and what he did, we have no choice. We're locked into our view. But Jesus came out of love and took on humanity and took on the form of a human and lived the perfect life we failed to live in our place, earned by his goodness what we've lost because of our failures. And then he suffered the consequence of our sin for the wages of sin is death. That's why he died on the cross. He died on the cross for our sin, not for his. And then he rose again so he could offer to us what only he deserved, new life. And because of Jesus, we have this choice. It doesn't come from anyone else or any other means. We have a choice. But here's the reality. We have to make it. And just because we're in a church or listening to a spiritual talk like this doesn't mean we've made it. Just because we know our view and we know his view doesn't mean we've changed our view or let Jesus redeem us in our view. And as I got ready for this talk, the 
One of the profound and great stories of Jesus came to my mind, the, the story of the rich fool. And don't get upset with me for using the word fool because I, I didn't make the story up. Jesus told the story. We're just kind of reporting the facts. And in the story of the rich fool, you have a very human circumstance. You have two brothers who are fighting over their inheritance. What else is new? You know, family's not the value, you know, loving's not the value, but money, that's the value, and it happens in families all the time. It just rips them apart, and that's what was going on with these two brothers. And so one of the brothers had the gall to come to Jesus and say, my brother's ripping me off. Can you straighten him out? <laughs> and Jesus says, oh, let me just tell you a story. And he says, there was this rich guy, really rich guy, had barns, had it all. But then he had an unbelievable year, an unexpected year, and he went from being rich to mega rich. We know that in our world, right? It's not enough anymore to be a multi-multi-millionaire. Oh, no. Now it's a billionaire. So you go from, from wealthy to mega wealthy. But this guy's problem, according to Jesus, was that he never considered anyone but himself. He became mega rich, and he didn't consider how he could now change the social injustices of the world or how he could come alongside and help the impoverished and how he could make a difference in this world and bring pleasure to God. No, he, he only thought of himself. And this is what he said, hey, go, man, I have so much now that I can eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of my life. So I'm going to build the bigger, I'm going to tear down my big barns and I'm going to build mega barns and it's going to be great for me. And then Jesus has a twist in the story. And he said, the only problem was God came down that night and said, none of that will do you any good because tonight's the night you die. Puts it in perspective. Would you trade places with a billionaire if you knew the day you traded places was the day you died? How worthless is that? Jesus said he was a fool because he only thought about the here and now but life is temporary in the here and now, and there's more to consider. Now, there's a lot that we can get from that story, but let me give you this one important takeaway. We make foolish choices when all we see and consider is the here and now. That's what we do. We make foolish choices when we only see and consider the here and now. And according to experts, we as human beings in every arena of our life on a daily basis make about 35,000 choices. So when we consistently make foolish choices, what we're doing on a daily basis times 35,000 is playing the role of the fool. And you know what happens? We ruin our lives. We ruin our relationships. And in the end... We ruin our world. Any of this sound familiar to what we're experiencing right now? Of course it does. Explains a lot. But there's good news. The good news is that when we genuinely follow Jesus, not become religious, not show up in church, when we genuinely follow Jesus, he changes our view. And he rescues us from making so many foolish choices. We go from living for the here and now to living for the eternal. So let's establish the baseline truth. The truth is simply that when we have Jesus' view of the world, not the one we have by nature, not the one we're born with, but when we, by following Jesus, have Jesus' view of the world, we will see and value today and all of today's decisions and experiences in light of eternity. I'm not going to value today and my choices today based upon the here and now, if I have Jesus' view, but based upon the eternal. That's what he did. Now, Paul the Apostle, inspired by God, wrote it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18. For our light and momentary troubles, and by the way, just got to stop here, our light and momentary troubles. When I think of light and momentary troubles, I think of, I'm hungry, I need a bar, you know? Not a drinking bar, you know, a breakfast bar. 
or I have a hangnail. You know, these little things that we deal with. But that's not what he saw. His light and momentary troubles, he was being rejected. He was being beaten. He was being left for dead. And he was being thrown unjustly into prison where he was left to rot. And ultimately, he lost his life as a martyr for his message of Jesus Christ. And he calls that light and momentary. How can he call that light and momentary? Because he knew it was just the here and now, not the eternal. So he says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. I don't weigh my today's experience by today. I weigh it by eternity. And that far outweighs everything else. So this is how I live. And he's counseling us. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, the here and now, but on what is unseen, the eternal. Why? For what is seen is just temporary, the rich fool. But what is unseen is eternal. And so when we have this eternal view, we see today in light of eternity, and it changes everything. This is important. This is not a subtext to Christianity. This is not a peripheral thing. This is at the core, and yet most of us are missing it. As we sing our songs and do our religious stuff, we continuously live in the here and now without a view of eternity. So let me give you the place where this can change in our lives. The application, the so what. How can this make a difference in our lives? Well, if we're going to make consistently wise choices, and can I just stop there just for a minute? Of course we want to make consistently wise choices. I've never met the person, not even the person I considered the biggest fool. I've never met the person that says, you know what, my entire life's goal is to be a fool. I want to be a fool as a husband, I want to be a fool as a wife, I want to be a fool as a parent, I want to be f a fool in my vocation, I want to be a fool, but there's, there's not that person. No, the rich fool didn't want to be a rich fool. It was the natural consequence of having a view of the here and now. And so if we really want to consistently make wise choices in our lives, which don't come naturally, then we must intentionally and rigorously choose to develop an eternal perspective. Go from the now to the eternal in our view of our lives. You see, when we have an eternal perspective, it changes our choices, all 35,000 of them a day, from foolish to wise. But how do we get there? When I was growing up, in churches, I rejected God pretty early on because this is the point at which they got in their messages and then they stopped. You want to be a fool? Don't be a fool. Be wise. Have a good day. What? God gives us the means for going through this redemptive process, this transformation, and we need to spend time with it. Now, to do that, we have to dig a little bit deeper. We have to go a little bit further. To do that, you have to dig a little deeper to listen. But I'm telling you, it will be worth every ounce you give to it because this can change your lives forever. How do we develop an eternal perspective? It's been the struggle of my lifetime. It's still my struggle. But here's what God says about it. In order to develop an eternal perspective, we must begin at the beginning. We must begin increasing our faith. Because there's no way I'm saying no to the power of this moment for something I don't even truly have the faith to believe will ever happen. It's not going to happen. So we have to begin where it must begin by increasing our faith. And the Bible says this so clearly. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to bring pleasure to God. Without faith, you're going to live in the here and now because you've got it. It's a guarantee. Because anyone who comes to God must believe, takes faith, that he exists. You have to believe he exists and that he goes beyond that. That he actually rewards those who earnestly seek him. And where does God reward us? the eternal realities. It's where his promises are absolutely guaranteed. And so we have to increase in our faith. But how do we increase in our faith? And God called me to be a pastor as a Christian. 
And I have to tell you, it takes faith. And I don't have it on my own. So I've had to struggle and wrestle through this development of faith thing. And here's how we have to struggle. You begin increasing your faith so you can believe in eternity in the first place by, by asking God for it. And you, you might be going, your IQ is pretty weak, isn't it, Brad? I mean, really? You're going to start there? Yeah, I am. I'm going to start right there. Because I would bet that most of you, it's been a very long time, if you can ever remember, since you asked God for the faith you need. And, and look what the Bible says, James 4, 2. You do not have because you do not... Yeah, not many of you wanted to participate, right? So I'm going to ask you to participate. You do not have because you do not... That's where it starts. You know why? Because faith is not something we can muster up. I can't muster up the ability to believe in the eternal. I've never touched it. I can't muster up the ability to believe in a God that is so much bigger than my comprehension, but God can gift me with that. And so I start by asking, so do you. You need to start praying, God, increase my faith. Increase, I'm having a real difficult time claiming your promises. Increase my faith. Help me to see the eternal, not just the here and now, because in the here and now, I'm suffering big time. I'm lost. And then if we're going to increase our faith, we need to do it by spending time in God's Word. Amen. We need to spend time in God's Word because my here and now life is based upon the thoughts I have. But the eternal realities of the world are based upon the thoughts He has. And if I'm going to increase in faith, I need to turn to His Word. Romans 10, 17, consequently faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. So it's by spending time in God's word that we can increase our faith. And you can, and you should be doing this personally. It shouldn't just be something you do with us. Most people have a Bible of some kind, right? Even if it's got 15 inches of dust on it on your bookshelf lost somewhere, you've got it. It'd be good to take that thing out every once in a while, take allergy medicine for the dust, and then open it. Spending time in... I'm sorry for speaking so real to you, but yeah, I'm a human too. I don't use a, a book. I use Bible software. And so my Bible is on my computer or my iPad. And, and I have to tell you, this isn't something I'm just telling you. Every single morning, almost, very few mornings it doesn't happen. Something has to totally turn the day upside down. But every morning, this is my morning, I get up, I shuffle because I'm old, <laughs> into the kitchen. I first drink a huge glass of water, and then I brew my coffee. And then, Lincoln, my dog, follows me into my office where I have this leather chair I've had for a couple of decades. I sit down on it, and the very first thing I open is God's Word. Very first thing. Here's why. Here's why. Every day I will, by nature, think my thoughts. But I won't think His. And if I'm going to change my view, I've got to let him pour his thoughts in me and increase my faith. You need to do this. And there are ways. You don't have to be a pastor to do this. Are you kidding? This is for all of us. Maybe you don't have a Bible. Maybe you don't have software. That's fine. There's an app that you can get. It's the version app. And you, you can get that, by the way. You can even get that on a stupid phone, Android. Okay? <laughs> I'm joking. I believe it, but, you know, God didn't say it, so I can't hold you to it. Or an iPhone, you can get this app, and it gives you devotionals, steps for how, it makes easy access, it can take you deep, all that stuff. Start spending time in God's Word personally, but then it shouldn't stop there. Then you should take advantage of every opportunity we give you that's relevant for your step right now, where you are right now. 
And we have a ton of studies for men and women and couples and singles, tons. And all you have to do is choose it. Go to northridgechurch.com slash groups. Or, need some more simple than that? Text us the word groups. You might get blisters, I know. But text us the word grips, groups, or grips. <laughs> but it won't get you the right stuff. To the number 31616, and we'll give you information on how you can get involved in studies and be hearing God's word. Does that make sense? But then, uh, if we're going to increase in faith, we need to start taking steps of faith. See, it's not enough for me to sit down with God's word in the morning and go, cool, that was awesome, on to the next thing. It's important for me to say, how am I going to act on that? How does that change my view from the here and now to the eternal? If you never stand on God's promises, your faith will never increase in God. I'm taking steps today I couldn't have even comprehended four decades ago, but it's still the same difficult one step. And the only reason I'm taking these steps is because I've been taking steps for four decades. Every step is a tough one, but it builds our faith in God. Look at how God says it in Hebrews 10, 38, but my righteous one, it's speaking of Messiah, of course, Jesus, the one who will ultimately represent him as righteous. But the carryover is we're supposed to be becoming like Jesus, so it should apply to us. But my righteous one will live by faith. If you're living by faith, every step you're taking is a step of faith, right? It's based on the eternal, not the here and now. And he says, I take no pleasure at all in the one who shrinks back from taking steps of faith. Whew. So we have to take steps of faith. Now, to really bring this home for you, I thought, for me, I need to kind of wrestle with things for a while. For me, it helped me to think of a real-world example of how steps of faith help build our faith. Okay, and so, for me, it all rotates around skydiving. Now, I'm curious, how many of you have ever jumped out of an airplane with a parachute? Raise your hand if you have. You have? Okay. I only saw about 10, 15 people, which means the rest of you are brilliant and wise, right? <laughs> and we're crazy. But let me use the illustration anyway. A long time ago, in fact, growing up, all my life, I've kind of been a crazy guy. I used to say, man, I'd love to go skydiving. Man, I'd love to jump out of an airplane. That'd be the greatest thing ever. Well, finally, those around me got sick of hearing the talk, and they wanted to see the walk. And so my family and the creative team here at Northridge said, all right, you want to jump out of an airplane so bad, we're going to do it, shoot it on video, so you can use it for a talk. And I went, no, I just want to talk about how much fun it would be, right? <laughs> so all of a sudden I had accountability, and to double the accountability, my son goes, I want to do it, Dad, I want to do it. And so here we are, all signed up, ready to go. Video team's there, we're going through the thing, and I'm putting on the face, because video shooting, right? And I'm going, how are you feeling, Brad? Oh, this is great, live stream, so exciting. Blake was going, isn't this fun, Dad, isn't this fun? And I'm going, yeah, Blake. And inside I'm going, what have I done? I was scared. I was, I was scared to death. I was scared. So we're up in the plane. I had no option. Everybody was watching. <laughs> and the worst that could happen is I'd be dead and then I wouldn't care anymore. And so out of the plane we went. You know what happened when I landed? First thing I said is, I want to go do that again right now. You know why? It was the only experience, I'm a quick processor, it was the only experience I had that gave me sensory overload. I couldn't, I couldn't even take it all in. I had to just pick a couple of things to focus on. it. And then when the chute opened, it was this like most tranquil moment of my life. And we landed, and parachute worked. It was awesome. It was everything anyone had ever said and more. And I wanted to go do it again. Why? Because I took one step of faith. It was easier to take it again. But I didn't go do it again. We didn't have time. We had to go on. And guess what's happened? All these years have gone by now. And I've never done it again. So you know where I am now? Right back where I was in the beginning. My daughter's been asking me, Hey, Dad, you want to go skydiving with me? And I go, 
I'd love to, honey, but I've got to spend time praying today. You know, I mean, really, I, I just think that that's my calling. I, I, I don't want to do it again. I'm scared again. Why? Because it's been so long since I took a step of faith in a parachute. The same thing holds true for our lives of faith. The reason we have such a hard time believing in God's promises is because we've not been experiencing God fulfilling them. And the reason we haven't been experiencing God fulfilling them is because we haven't been taking steps of faith. We've been doing what we can justify in the here and now. Many of us do this financially, right? I can settle with this in the here and now. And many of us do this with the way I can do this in the here. And it's all here and now. A step of faith demands finally taking a step into that which matters for eternity. We need to start. or we're going to stay upside down. If we're going to develop an eternal perspective, then it goes further. We have to begin looking for God in every circumstance. As our faith starts to increase, we need to start looking for God in every circumstance. And this isn't how we live. We generally look for God at church once in a while. We tend to look for him if everything's disastrous and we desperately need him now. But generally, we don't look for God in every circumstance, which is why we're mad at him. You're letting this happen. You're letting this happen. You've missed this. You've missed this. We're not, we're not seeing because that's what we see in the here and now. But, but look at the reality, Romans 8, 28. And we can know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That's the promise of God. Now, does that say that all things are good? No, all things aren't good. Read the Bible. We live in an upside down world. It's almost all bad in this human experience in many ways. Let's be honest. But yet in all of those things, even the worst of the worst, God's still working. And he's trying to bring about his goodwill. And so we have to, if we have a here and now view, we won't look for God. We'll get bitter, we'll reject him, we'll do all kinds of stuff, which is where most are. But if we get the eternal view, what do we do? We look for him no matter how far away he seems. Wow. Let me just give you a couple examples because examples work for me. Paul the Apostle. So I've already told you, he was beaten, he was left for dead, he was thrown in prison. From prison one time, rotting away. Look what he wrote in Philippians 1.12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that all that's happened to me, all this suffering and tragedy, has actually served to advance the gospel. Instead of saying, I'm in prison, God, where are you? I have a message to deliver to the world. He, in the midst of the pain, looked for God and realized, oh, I know, God, you're working. And since your goal for me is to tell people about your love and truth, I can do it here in prison where I wouldn't normally be able to communicate your truth. And in that Caesar-owned prison, he was able to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ to those guards and ultimately had spread the hope of Jesus through Caesar's household. He looked for God in the circumstance. Want another example? How about a guy named Joseph? Read the Old Testament. Hey, you want his background? His brother sold him into slavery. I have three brothers. They can be cruel. They've never once sold me into slavery. And how did he respond? I tell you how I'd respond. I'm mad at God. What's going on? I'm trying to be a good guy. But that's not how. As a slave, you know what he did? He looked for God in that circumstance and he decided in the worst of life circumstances, can't think of anything worse than slavery, can you? In the midst of those horrible circumstances, he looked for God. And as a result, he lived for God's pleasure. And he stood out. And then he was thrown in prison unjustly, and they're in prison. Instead of getting mad at God and saying, this is unjust, like Paul, he looked for God in that circumstance, and he said, I'm going to please you even here in prison, and he stood out. And he ended up getting where he couldn't get. He became second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt. That's just impossible. That's what God was doing. And you know why God was doing it? because a famine was coming to the land and people were going to die everywhere, including his family, his brothers, who sold him. His brothers show up looking for food. 
if my brothers ever showed up looking for food and they never sold me into slavery, <laughs> that'd be a fun time. But it wasn't to Joseph because he looked for God. He lived for not the now, but for the eternal. And look what he said. You intended to harm me, my brothers, but God intended your evil for good to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives, yours and others. He looked for God in every circumstance because he had an eternal perspective. Is that how you lived this last week? Because it's not just Paul and Joseph, it's also us who are called to this. Look at James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience all the good times. No, we don't have to be told to have joy during the good times. Consider it joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials and suffering of many kinds. Why? Because you can know that the testing of your faith is being used of God to produce perseverance, persevering character in you. Let that character finish its work so that you may become exactly what Jesus wants you to become mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so, when we begin developing an internal perspective, we begin seeing our present circumstances differently. And it changes our choices from foolish to wise, from upside down to right side up. In order to develop an eternal perspective, there's another step we need to take. We have to begin considering the eternal consequences of every decision. And I have to tell you, this isn't my nature. But this is the requirement. In every choice, in all 35,000 of them a day, we need to start considering the eternal consequences. And you say, why? Why? Well, this is the teaching of Jesus, Matthew 12, 36. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment to God for every empty word they have spoken. Do you know every word we speak is a choice? Every word. And he's saying, use your words in the now for eternal value. But we don't. And then he goes further. Look at Mark 8, 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world in the now but forfeit their soul in eternity? It's a waste. So we need to consider not what's good for the now but what are the eternal consequences in every decision. But can we be honest here? One of the reasons we fail to have an eternal perspective is because we're not confident that eternity will be real for us. Children, I, I, we've done this experiment before. I've done it with my kids and grandkids. It's really fun to see their view. And so you can do it with ice cream really well. Of course, it works with you adults pretty well as well. But with kids, it's easy to say, hey, I'll give you this ice cream now or $5 later and they're going I don't know about later but I know about now ice cream every day but it's not just kids it's us you think about the choices of your life what will make me feel better now what will be good for me now what will make me happy now what do I want now how am I feeling now and we're throwing away the only thing that counts to have confidence in God's promise of eternal life, we need to know we have it, which means we have to choose the right option. And I'm gonna simplify this, but there are basically two options you have. One comes naturally, one only comes from God. The first option is to stand in your own goodness. Stand in your own goodness. And I have to be honest, some of you are a lot better than me. Some of you are probably a lot better than most people in this auditorium. But you know what? I don't think anyone here is better than Mother Teresa or Billy Graham. And you, you know what they knew? Their own goodness wasn't enough. I mean, the Bible says it. Look at Romans chapter 3, a couple of verses. There is no one who does good, not even one of us. 
For all have sinned and fall short of what God created us for, the glory of God. And here's the important part. The wages of sin is death. And so when I stand in my own goodness, there's no hope. But there's another option. We can stand in Jesus' goodness. It's the only secret place to stand. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Jump to verse 21. How does that happen? Because God made him Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, who are sinners, so that in him we might become what we can't do on our own, the righteousness of God. We can have the promise of eternity by standing in his goodness. Changes everything. You see, when all I have is the here and now, it's because I'm standing in my goodness. It's all I have. But when I'm standing in his goodness, I know I have eternity because I'm living for and in the living Savior. I have eternal hope. So let me share it from a very personal perspective. And this is not hyperbole, this is real. Here's my reality. I am a very flawed person. Flawed to the core. And I have messed up so much in my life. And yet to this day, I mess up. And if I was standing in my own goodness, I'd have no hope of eternity. I'd just need to keep living for this moment because I knew it was all I have. In my own goodness, I'd have to live for the here and now. In my own goodness, I would just be Brad the fool. But because I've chosen to stand by faith in Jesus' goodness, my flaws and my failures don't define my eternity. Jesus does. So I can be absolutely confident in the hope of eternity, not because I earned it or deserve it, because he earned it, deserves it, and gives it away. And that's what changes the way I live. How about you, really? You will never make consistently wise choices until you settle the idea of your eternity. So why not do that right now? Just before we finish, I'm just going to ask you if you just for a moment bow with me in a word of prayer. Would you do that? Just let's pray and then I'll finish up. It, no matter who you are here, I bet you you have things that you can talk to God to, acknowledge to God, but while you're doing that for those of you who've never gone from standing in your own goodness and only having now to standing in his goodness and having eternity, I'm going to invite you to take the first step of faith. To go from foolish choices to wise choices to choose to stand in his goodness. And all you have to do is just... It doesn't have to be out loud or dramatic. Just take my words in this prayer and make them yours to God. Just say, Jesus, I've been standing in my own goodness and I've blown it so badly. I've sinned. I'm guilty. Forgive me. But I really believe that you are good. That you lived the life I failed to live, died on the cross to save me and then rose again to give me new life. And so right now, I'm repenting of standing in my goodness. And by faith, I'm choosing to stand in your goodness. Amen. If you just, just before I finish, if you just prayed with me, let us know, would you? In fact, last weekend we had hundreds and hundreds of people make decisions, but I didn't give you this opportunity, so maybe you can retroactively do this as well. But if you've made the decision to follow Jesus and haven't done this, just text us the word Northridge to the number 31616. Northridge to 31616. And we'll send you a link and you'll be able to say, I made this decision or I did this, and then we'll send you the appropriate response and a journal of a book of the Bible that can really help you spend time in God's Word, but you have to send the text. Finally, in order to develop an eternal perspective, in the end, 
we must begin actually living for our eternal purposes instead of our present pleasure. We have to go from living for the pleasure that comes in the moment to living for the delayed promise of pleasure that comes from pleasing God. And we have to start making this choice. And what is our eternal purpose? Romans 8, 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined or predetermined that they would be conformed to the likeness of his son. Do you know what God's purpose for you is? To live not like the first Adam, whose nature we received, fallen, lost in the here and now, but to become like the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who's experiencing life as God designed it. That's our purpose, to become like Jesus. So we have to start living in the moment to become more like Jesus with each choice we take. Ephesians 2.10 goes further. We are God's workmanship, once redeemed, created in Christ Jesus to do not temporary works, but good works, eternal works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so in the here and now, we should be seeking to bring pleasure to God instead of pleasure to ourselves. And you know what the result would be? I mean, this is the whole Christian life. We begin increasing in our faith. We begin looking for God in all of our circumstances. We begin living this eternal purpose instead of our personal pleasure in the moment. And you know what the result of all that is? Regardless of our circumstances, good or bad, happy or sad, we will still live according to values that are pleasing to God. And when we do that, we'll experience genuine fulfillment. Because fulfillment doesn't come by pleasing ourselves now. Fulfillment comes with knowing that God is pleased with us now and will be forever. Too many of us are empty. And it's because we're living for what the fool lived for instead of what Jesus has made possible for us. Look at how 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10 says it. We make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it, alive or dead, for we must all appear before that judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Everything done for the here and now, bad. Everything done for God's pleasure in eternity, good. That needs to be how we start living. So this weekend, I want to encourage you to make the choice to develop an eternal perspective. If you don't, you're going to continue to pile up regrets just like the rich fool in Luke 12. But if you do, you'll start making wise choices and experiencing what Jesus promised. Life and life to the full. And that you will never regret. I'm so glad you were here this weekend. I hope you'll be back next weekend and invite some people. We'll see you then. Bye, everybody.